I'm Richard Dodd, and you're listening to the Ecology Academy podcast. This is a show where we get to talk and learn about all things ecological, including interviews with top ecologists, both employers and employees, those working with ecologists, and also aspiring and inspiring career-seeking individuals setting out to make a difference. The show aims to provide you with insights, advice, and inspiration to help you succeed and excel as an effective ecologist and to make a real difference to our natural environment. Joining me today on the Ecology Academy podcast is Jim Mulholland. Now, Jim is an ecologist and arboriculturist with special interest in veteran trees and bats. He runs Bat Research and Training, which was set up to help professionals to achieve a bat survey license. Alongside training, he's also researching how to improve tree surveys for bats and whether it's possible to create artificial roosts in trees. When he's not running the business, he works for the Vincent Wildlife Trust as a senior bat conservation officer and also training for a half marathon. So which which do you enjoy the most, Jim? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh, blimey. Well, it's got to be the the trees. I think the trees win it over for me. Yeah. Uh, without the trees, you wouldn't have the bats, and of course, without the trees, you wouldn't have the humans to do the half marathons in the first place. So, uh, yeah, it all comes back to the trees, I think, for me, Richard. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for joining with, joining us today, and uh, it's, a pleasure. it's going to be a great uh, conversation to be had with you. We've had a quick conversation before uh, we hit the record button here, so I know we're going to talk about a few things that I'm I'm extremely interested in, and I'm, I'm sure. Uh, our listener will as well. But um, before we start, let's let's talk about you in terms of um, how you got into bats and the, the work you do now. So wh- how did that start? I guess I can trace it all the way back. I remember at senior school, not really knowing what I wanted to do for my options at GCSEs and having a conversation with the headmaster who, who was a doctor. And he was the person who encouraged me to do the separate sciences and from there i was always interested in science loved physics loved chemistry but in particular it was biology it's it's living things that have always fascinated me and i never really knew what i wanted to do or what jobs were available just knew that i kind of wanted to follow my interests i guess so that led on to studying at university and whilst i was there i met my lovely now wife laura who had been into bats from a very young age so having met her, we had a, a lecture one day that the, uh, he mentioned bats and said that you need a license to be able to work with them. And that there are these things known as bat groups and they go out and do all sorts of crazy things looking for bats in the local area. So that kind of piqued our interest. We tried to find access to a local bat group near us. We were in Bristol at the time, but didn't really get um, much feedback from Avon Bat Group. So we eventually found some luck and uh, were taken on by a chap called Steve Lawrence in Wiltshire Bat Group, a fantastic man. And kind of followed it from there on in really, and met some fantastic people, I think as alongside working with these incredible creatures. It's just a, a range of amazing and quirky and weird people that spend their time studying these animals and haven't really looked back since then. Mm-hmm. I left university and went into a career of ecological consultancy. But after a few years of doing that, I got slightly jaded, slightly disillusioned, mainly because I was having to drag myself out of bed at two o'clock in the morning to go and do dawn surveys. And I thought, is this it? Is this my life now? I have to kind of wake up and I'm a big fan of sleep. I can do late nights. I just cannot do early mornings. And I thought maybe I'll go and do something else. And I had a, a friend who was working in arboriculture. I was chatting to him about that. And he gave me a bit of encouragement to go and study trees. So I did that, retrained in arboriculture. I kind of then took the opportunity to leave ecology altogether and I moved into arboriculture and I was a tree officer for a number of years and then more recently I've been lucky enough to have a number of roles that draw on both disciplines and one of the very first ones that drew on both of them was a role with the Ancient Tree Forum and that as you can imagine combines both trees but also a huge part of ancient and veteran trees are their ecological values not only for bats but for wood decay invertebrates and wood decay fungi. And so I think 
tracing it all the way back i trained initially with bats in savanac forest in wiltshire nice. and we were surrounded by a huge number of ancient in particular oak trees within the forest and i kind of just assumed that all ancient woodlands were like that now with hindsight i realized that actually no of course it's very unique in that sense it used to be a kind of a, an ancient wood pasture and the closed canopy woodland is a relatively modern thing but I think my my interest in the old trees got peaked back then because they're just you know just amazing to be around you know huge, wonderfully old gnarly and twisted trees. So I worked at the Ancient Tree Forum and was lucky enough to kind of travel and meet lots of other uh, veteran tree enthusiasts. I also worked at another charity called the Arb Association, and um, yeah, kind of it all kind of percolates into one. And I have been lucky enough. To kind of just follow my interest i guess and sometimes it's trees sometimes it's bats and if i'm very lucky it's when i get bats in trees and that's i guess where how i've ended up here oh, wonderful excellent and in terms of which university was it bristol university you went to you're sorry here yeah, you went, went went to no not bristol i i studied at ue i UE. didn't get the grades to go to bristol i didn't behave very well at, at a level <laughs> i went to a very strict senior school and um left that and went to college and i vividly remember my physics teacher telling me during a one-to-one well if if you're not going to study or or you don't want to study i'm not going to make you and i thought great i'm not going to study then and the result was some fairly poor a level results which sent me on a completely different trajectory because i didn't really know what i wanted to do Mm. and had i got the grades I would have gone to Bristol and studied, I think, environmental geoscience. I would have been one of those boring rock people. But instead, I didn't get the grades. My fallback was UE in Bristol because I didn't want to go very far from home. That's where I've been brought up. Um, And I think it was incredibly fortunate, actually, that that decision was made for me because I ended up focusing on living things. I've met my now wife, Laura, and the rest is history. Absolutely. No, I I I certainly believe in the sort of... uh... You know, um, those those chance moments you get. So where those uh, that's that sliding door for their sort of theory, really. But so uh, yeah, I mean, I, you're right. I mean, I, I things were cut off for me in terms of going to certain universities. Yeah, and, that's with, and this was no A levels, <laughs> so it was a little <laughs> bit more challenging getting into university with no A levels. <laughs> that's quite a feat. How did you manage that then? Oh well, it, yeah, it's, it's 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 it's. I suppose it's one way. It's playing universities off each, each other. And so I was doing a correspondence. And this is going back quite a few years. Correspondence, A level biology, and um, um, and yeah, applied for seven universities. No English university wanted to know me whatsoever. Um, so I think I applied for I think I applied for Bristol, Birmingham, Nottingham, um, Wolverhampton because that's where I was originally from. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why you always apply for a home one, uh, and uh, Cardiff, Aberystwyth, and Bangor. And so as I say, none of the English ones got back to me at all went to Cardiff they gave me a conditional offer to get a grade B uh, to go on to their foundation course not to go straight yeah. into zoology but uh, and then went to Aberystwyth uh, had an interview which I thought I completely uh, you know um, just gone completely wrong you know they asked me some interesting questions but they gave me an unconditional offer so to ah. me in my naivety I thought well okay well I'll go to university uh, I prefer Cardiff phoned Cardiff phoned Cardiff not emailed phoned Cardiff up and they go yeah we'll match it and so the rest is history as you say so, yeah. very nice I think it just goes to show that uh, for anyone considering their kind of career paths and they're studying at the moment or thinking about going to university that it's not all about grades yeah. and this was something that was definitely lacking from my very strict senior school education it was rammed down my throat that the grades were the most important thing and with the hindsight now, I've realized that's really not the case, that it's, it's more to do with people because people are the ones that give you jobs, the people who pay the bills. And if you're good with people, kind of everything else will fall into place, won't it? So the technical skills are clearly important. But I think the thing that was lacking from my early education was this idea of being able to get on with people. And um, so, yeah, I'm very lucky that I ended up going down the path that I did. Excellent. Great. Well, let's go. Uh, let's get back on track in terms of your your role then. So, in terms of, I mean, I mean, obviously, bats 
research and training. So let's look at the bats and research part of the, your company itself then. So uh, I know I say you both, you've both you got a special interest in veteran trees um, and also you said the bats themselves. And I'm looking at your website in that video where it says, can we do better for bat surveys? And can you tell us a little bit more about um, how we should be, I mean, why we should be doing better uh, in terms of uh, for, for bats and, and for trees and um, what's um, what you researching at the moment? Sure thing. Yeah. So for many years, I guess since people have been interested in bats, that our main knowledge comes from bats in buildings or bats in underground structures, caves, tunnels, those types of things, because you can physically get into them and you can observe that they're there. And if you think about the hibernation stuff, that you have cavers and underground explorers that would be going about doing what they want to do and inadvertently coming across bats so they learn about where the bats are in the process. And then equally, when people have buildings, they'd wander in and see that they've got bats in there. And so we kind of develop some knowledge from that. But the same isn't quite the case for trees so i'm sure that people would have come across them but we don't routinely go around kind of climbing into woodpecker holes or in splits and cracks in trees so our knowledge about bats in trees was kind of on the back foot i guess it was um largely borrowed from what we thought we knew about bats in buildings so this idea that okay they'll probably be there for a reasonable amount of time that the field signs such as droppings will be in kind of uh, be present as well and it was only when we started going out and a number of individuals kind of developed an interest around the same kind of time. And it was, when did I start to climb? I think 2013, I learned to climb trees and bought my endoscope. And it was 2015 when I really started putting a lot of effort into it. So we were lucky enough to have access to a site near to where I live at the Talkworth Estate. And we just went out prospecting. So on the first day, went to a parkland and said, okay, we've got a load of ecologist climbers here, a few arborists as well, and said, okay, let's just climb some trees. So spot a feature and go and climb it. And in that first day, we found five bat roosts. It was pretty much the first five trees that we climbed, amazingly. And I thought, great, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll come back each month and then we'll have a picture of how bats use these trees across a whole year. Wouldn't that be great? And we'll learn so much in the process. And we found out after completing at least a year, sometimes even more, that actually bats move around a hell of a lot. And they're quite tricky to pin down actually in the roost, in the trees themselves. So it kind of really made me begin to question, well, the survey approach that we had at the time was look at your trees, you look for features. If you've got a feature you think is suitable, then you might do maybe two or three emergent surveys on it. And the assumption was that that would give you a realistic idea of whether bats are using that feature. And of course, we know from work that was undertaken as part of the Battery Habitat Key project that the the encounter rate for certain bat species can be as low as about 5%. So to spin that round, you know, normally in science, we're looking for 95% confidence. And so to spin it round, if you undertake one visit, you've got a 95% likelihood of not finding bats, even if that feature is used by bats. So the deck is really, really stacked against us. And so the work I was doing kind of ran in parallel with the work that Henry was doing at the Battery Habitat Key at the same time. And we fed the results of our work into that database as well, because that database only gets better the more that people contribute to it. And we were slowly building up this picture that, okay, well, bats, they move round fairly frequently. And if we are only undertaking a small number of visits, then we're just not going to find bats. And furthermore, our approach to surveying trees at the time was largely based on ground level surveys. So you look at a tree, you spot a feature, you say, okay, let's come back at night to see if any bats come out of it. And of course, you'd be mad to do that any time outside of the April to September standard survey season. You know, you're not going to find many bats between April and September, I would suggest, but you'd be mad if you want to stand outside of a tree in November or December or even January, because you're going to get very cold and you're not really going to record any bats. But that kind of fails to recognize that we have some bat species that have to stay in the trees all year round. So if you think of nocturnal bats, for example, they're pretty much tree obligates. So they spend all year round in the tree. So if we are not surveying trees in winter 
Um, you know, noxious are very widespread species, very fond of woodpecker holes. You get those two things quite widespread across the country. So for most sites, really, we should be doing winter surveys. You know, if you're not doing those surveys, you're just doing those bat species a complete disservice. Mm -hmm. And so the the question that I posed, and I, I spoke at the conference, the tree conference and the bat conference in 2017 was exactly that. Can we do better? And that was very much a kind of a, a therapy session for me, I guess, that I had been out, I'd been looking at these trees and we just were not finding bats, not any, anywhere near as frequently as you would hope. And it's basically a numbers game. And if you just keep going out, you keep going out time and time again, climb as many trees as you can, you will eventually find bats. But, you know, they're kind of in the minority, really, the times you actually find bats. And we looked into things such as field signs as well and bat droppings, again, f borrowed from the idea of bats in buildings. You assume that they hang around. But, of course, buildings are sterile environments. They're dry, relatively warm. You know, you don't necessarily have a buildup of the invertebrates that decompose droppings. Whereas trees are the cavities and the splits and cracks. The first of all may not collect the droppings. But even if they do, they're going to break down because these are natural environments. So it really kind of made me worry. And that presentation was very much a therapy session of saying, this is a problem. This is what our, our standard guidance says, but we are missing bats. Without a doubt, we are missing bats. And so that was the kind of the first part of the journey. I went back to the bat conference in 2018 with an idea of, of using trail cameras. And this was borrowed from, I think it was Jersey Bat Group who was setting up trail cameras to see if they could be used to record bats emerging and re-entering roosts. And I tried it for a year on an, a number of our tree roosts and it had some reasonably good success and it kind of gave me optimism that okay i think this has legs i think we could do something with this another time i was working for the ancient tree forum and um, working on a european project called vet cert which is a certification scheme for people who manage veteran trees and my my line manager is uh, an amazing lady called vicky benson and she kind of most of her career she does consultancy in sweden but does lots of research projects and that was a time when we were in the european union remember how good those days were and had access to kind of funding streams there but she essentially gave me the confidence to realize that okay i have been successful in fundraising for the charity that i worked for but you don't have to work for a charity necessarily to be able to fundraise to undertake this type of research that if you've got a good idea and you can convince people to give you the money then you can set up your own research project and kind of take it forward so that's what i'm working at on at the moment so i had a fantastic conversation with vicky we were doing a course in finland and she was giving me some pointers about a, a veteranization project that mm. she's involved with mm. and um she had had some success with bats using these features that were never designed for bats they were designed for nesting birds primarily but bats were turning up in them and so we spoke about well how could you adapt those for bats and kind of came away with a few ideas, came back to the UK, looked around for some funding and closing that month was a funding stream with the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to apply for it. So I did that and was lucky enough to get funding from them. And that's the project we're currently working on. It has two main strands of using trail cameras to, first of all, improve surveying trees for bats. And then the second strand is, OK, well, can we create artificial bat roosts in trees by cutting holes in them great i mean in terms of i suppose i mean technology plays a huge part in terms of uh, our advancement of knowledge and understanding of uh, you know let's say you know nature itself and i suppose no more so than with bats you know that that's a, they're problematic in terms of you know their the, 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 the behavior um so sneaky out, aren't they they're coming out at night you know i mean most of us are asleep yeah or training for half marathons you know and you know, <laughs> so but uh, uh, but yeah it's the tricky that, that those parts there so you know using using bat detectors to find them and also now yeah trail cameras but again imagine certain trail cameras then with infrared or i don't know about thermal imaging but um yeah, certainly infrared te technology associated with them yeah so the i think the vast majority i don't know if there's any thermal imaging uh, infrared ones so they have a kind of series of leds that when they a kind of sensor passive infrared sensor gets triggered then it, the machine fires up 
it illuminates the subject, whatever that is, and uh, then records what's going on. And of course, these things, I guess they come originally from the hunting sector mm, yeah. for people wanting to find out where game is or deer or, or whatever it is. And so they're designed primarily for large, slow moving mammals. And what we're trying to use them for is the complete opposite of that, of course. So we're looking at fast, very small mammals. And um, it's, it has been very interesting. And I've heard a number of people say that because of the, the inherent lag time, because they have to be triggered, then the machine has to wake up. There's a period of time between when something moves in front of it, you know, there's a period of time before it fires into action and it can capture what's going on. And I've heard so many people say, well, they're just not quick enough for bats. They're just not quick enough for bats. And I even did a, a presentation to a, a bat group last year, I think it was on Zoom, and someone was introducing me. Went through my bio, said, Jim's here to talk about this. You know, this is his background, et cetera, et cetera. And he's about to talk about trail cameras. And then he kind of went off on a complete tangent of his own making of saying, as we all know, trail cameras aren't quick enough to record bats coming out of trees. And I was like, hold on, I'm going to stop you there. Can I get into the talk? And yes. I'll tell you actually how you're wrong. Um, and so, yeah, it's amazing that I can kind of understand it to a certain regard, but people have just dismissed them mm -hmm. without actually trying them in the first place. And um, we've had such incredible results from them. So they're not perfect. We're not going to catch every single bat, but they're pretty good. And the main thing for me is just um, someone came up to me after one of the presentations I delivered to a different bat group and um, made me aware of this phrase that I hadn't heard before, which is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Absolutely. Which I thought sums this up very nicely. And it's just a, a step forward. And if we can use these to find more bat roosts and eventually conserve more bat roosts, then that's a step forward, isn't it? And I'm a big believer that if you build it, they will come. And if the industry demands better technology, then the manufacturers will build it. And we're already seeing Gareth Lang and a few others developing some of these cameras that record continuously on a loop and so we're seeing technology move forward in that regard already which is fantastic oh absolutely i think that's you know the one that you know we, we, that technology exists it's i think already you know we need cctv cameras for instance you know you're, you're re-recording over and over again um in terms of the i mean so we've got the cameras okay so there's some use there itself yep now obviously the cameras will be recording how about analysis of that then? So in terms of, do I have to, for say, um, maybe spend, I've done two hours or eight hours of recording, have I got to really go and watch this for another eight hours afterwards? Is, 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 what, 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 what else can I do to help speed up maybe that, um, that, um, you know, the, that, the analysis side of um, using trail cameras? You, you've asked the wrong question there, Richard. Oh, my, okay, go on. You have. You phrased it entirely wrong. So it's not, oh, this is a pain and this is a task that I need to do. This is, what am I going to find? Yeah, How exciting is this going to be? Around, and what, yes. what, 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 what will these cameras discover? And <laughs> we've actually recorded so many great things. And you can imagine every time we go out in the field, we have kind of have, we've got our system down now. So I have new cameras with fresh batteries, fresh cards that go out to the climber. The climber sends the, the camera down. I originally used to download it in the field, but eventually kind of moved on from that because that was a bit too time consuming. But we all, in the field, we all want to see what that camera has captured. Mm -hmm. And so with a very quick flicking through, you can generally find, yep, yeah, we've got bats on these cameras. And of course, we're putting these cameras up on known tree roosts. So it would be a bit different if you were putting them up on trees that you don't know have bats in. We have tried a few, interestingly. We have a few control trees. And interestingly, we're finding bats in these control trees that we didn't know were bat roosts, but the cameras are confirming that they are bat roosts. But just the, the interactions and the species we're finding on these cameras is incredible. So the, the tree roost that we are monitoring with these cameras were found initially through radio tracking of Beckstein's bats and Barbastel bats. The Beckstein's bats, we've had noctuals, Dorbentons and Natteras turning up in those same roosts in this kind of amazing time share agreement thing. And it makes me kind of cast my mind back to several years ago, just before I joined Wiltshire Council as a tree officer. A friend of mine was working there as a tree officer and um, he had a tree he needed to dismantle. Kind of dead beech tree over a child's play area 
So he saw it had some potential roost features. He climbed it, was just about to put an endoscope into a feature and the feature squeaked. So he doesn't have a license. So he stopped at that point, got down from the tree and he called me and said, can you come out and have a look? And so we went back and eventually we found a Dorbenton's maternity roost in this tree. It was fascinating stuff. So applied for a license, said we'd take it down in the winter, went to take it down. The arborist gets up in the tree to do a pre-work check. And there's a flipping nocturne in the same feature. And it had never occurred to me yeah. that you could have multiple bat species using the same feature. And I kind of thought, yep, I found the bat roost that is in this tree as if, you know, it could only ever be one. And that, with hindsight now, is completely mad, isn't it? Of course it is. Why there's going to be such competition for these habitats, these cavities, these splits. So, of course, we're going to see these different species interacting with them. So... We get kind of a range of species in the Bexteins ones. We're seeing other species such as pipistrels and brants turning up in the barbastel roosts as well. Um, not only do we get a range of species, we have amazing interactions. So I've got videos of two Bexteins bats having a disagreement. I don't know what they're arguing about, but they're clearly not happy with each other. I've got evidence of mating with noctuals. So going back to this idea of trail cameras not being fast enough to catch bats emerging from trees completely forgets that for some tree roosts, the bats aren't going anywhere in a hurry. So we've got video after video after video of this nocturnal bat rubbing its neck and the glands around its neck around the opening to the roost, wow. singing away. Yeah. So calling the females in, even female bats landing and crawling in. So proof that he's been successful in his advertisement calls as well. And not only bats, but we get, I've recorded stoats entering these features, which kind of links back to this idea of, okay, well, in buildings, bats are relatively safe, not completely safe from predation. Um, working for the Vincent Wildlife Trust now, we're having a few issues with owls entering horseshoe bat roost and not taking few bats, not very many, but essentially just spooking the bats and encouraging them to go elsewhere, which can have an issue, cause an issue. But if you think about stoats, weasels, pine martins, of course, they're going to be roaming the forests and they're just going to be checking these cavities because this is where their food comes from. So it kind of makes perfect sense that these tree dwelling bats have to keep moving because they have to reduce the odds of being found, don't they? Yeah, and when I was I think, uh, doing some work over in, in, in France and we had to, you know, it wasn't pine martin across there, it was stone martin. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, they were getting into the roosts and destroying or decimating these, uh, um, you know, horseshoe and greater mouse-eared roots, roosts, really, just by just coming in, predating upon them um, themselves. Sorry, Jim, just uh, took it away from you there a second. Oh, that's fine. I think this is really fascinating. And, and um, it's incredible as we see some success in ecology and species begin to reestablish, uh, especially our, some of these predators, so birds of prey or our carnivore mammals, that they, there will be impacts and there will be conflicts. Of course, there will be. And in a way, that's a fantastic sign, isn't it? Because that's showing that there's sufficient food available that we can sustain these predators. But of course, at key sites, we just need to be able to manage that appropriately and uh, make sure that uh, they don't disrupt all of that behavior or, or destroy an entire roost, I guess. But fundamentally, they would have co-evolved co with these things, yeah. these species. That's yeah. yeah, I remember seeing, I'm, I'm sure it's on one of your videos. Actually, it's one of your your teaser videos. You like doing these teaser videos. Um, I've seen the one where the bat's in there and there's a grey squirrel. There's a grey squirrel, uh, and you go, does what happens next? And it's a great cliffhanger. And no, I'm afraid I don't know what happens next. So I don't know if you can tell me, or is it is it, is it a secret that you need to go on the course or uh, watch the video to find out? So if you had attended the tree conference or the bat conference this year, you would have found out. You would have <laughs> seen that. Um, we uh, recording this on a Friday afternoon and I when I finish here with you Richard I'm going to be doing a Facebook live so obviously by the time this goes out people would have missed that but the recording will be available and that series of videos is the last sequence of videos in the presentation right so you're absolutely right so the the nocturnal bat so the one I mentioned this this mating roost so this is I think this is really key here that we have a male bat that's full of testosterone it's getting very territorial and it comes back to its roost site to find a grey squirrel already in residence. 
And I can tell you, going back to the point you made earlier on about the time spent to analyze this footage, that video, when I found that series of videos, my jaw just hit the floor and I could not wait to just show mm. anyone who was interested. You know, and this, this range is way outside of ecology, way outside of bats, because the, the footage, I think the camera is just perfectly angled because you can see inside the woodpecker hole directly. Everyone knows what a gray squirrel looks like. So even if people aren't familiar with a, a nocturnal bat, they kind of, they understand the size and kind of what's going on in the footage. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. And if people want to oh, see the, what happens terrible. next, they can catch up with the Facebook live. <laughs> what, such a professional, Jim, such a professional. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I mean, going back to that yeah I, I think it's um one common theme with everyone I, well it wasn't everyone i'm sure everyone but you know certainly most people that come on these podcasts is that sense of curiosity you know you're going in there and if you're absolutely right it's about your mindset it's not oh i've got to trawl through this it's what can i find yeah so yeah you know, i think i think you're absolutely right you know it's those who probably make the biggest leaps are probably those who were sort of uh, are the most curious so uh so uh, I, I, I applaud your curiosity. So um, in terms of then, um, the, you know, the, so you've got these, this bat license training course as well. So let, let's talk about your training courses themselves then. So you've got the let's say, license sure. and then the short courses. Um, typically, I mean, why did you set them up? And also what type of courses do you actually run? Sure. Yeah. So I have been delivering professional training courses for a number of years. When I started at the Ancient Tree Forum in 2016, I guess that was my first transition to training full time. And I've pretty much been involved with training full time since then. And I deliver a range of courses. So I do ecology, primarily bats, but also arboriculture. So veteran trees. I do things like um, trees in development, trees, pests and diseases beginning to kind of meet people occasionally maybe like a year later or a couple of years later and I'd have conversations with them and I would think okay well did you actually take anything from that day mm -hmm. and not necessarily criticism about the individuals but we know that with kind of new information that it takes a while to kind of sink into our brains or I'm guilty of it as well. I go to conferences, I get really excited about all the amazing work that's going on and the people doing crazy and wonderful things in whatever discipline that they are interested in. And I get really enthused and I kind of leave and I say, yes, let's go and do this. And then within a week or two weeks, you're back into the kind of day to day slog of normal work. And of course, you'd love to do that, but you've got a stack of emails or reports to write or whatever it is. And well, maybe we need to look at something that is a bit more long form and a bit more structured and people have a kind of a recognize whatever at the end of it. You know, it's not a qualification, it's a license, of course, so it's not even a, a certificate. It's, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. So I thought, well, if we set something up, then you know, would that be more rewarding? And that was kind of the initial catalyst for it, I guess, that wanting to kind of, I still do short courses, I still see that they are valuable, but I do wonder, you know, does it does it stick with people? And so the move to the bat license training was really just to say, okay, well, let's see if we can help people continue to progress. And so that's the kind of the catalyst for it, really. And uh, we set up originally and um, it was a fairly standard course. It was in person. This was back before COVID, if you remember those days. And we did a very kind of small course initially, but I then took a year off and wanted to rethink things slightly and thought, OK, well, can I make it modular? Can I make it so people can just choose the bits they want? And is there any scope for online learning? I had kind of developed a, an interest in kind of using online tools whilst working at the Ancient Tree Forum. So I mentioned Vicky earlier on. She was my line manager who lives in Sweden. And we worked very well together, despite the huge geographical distance between us, because we had the tools at the time. And I remember going to meetings where I was dragged into offices in London for nature conservation organizations having offices in London. And by the time you get in, it's like 10 or 11 o'clock. You have a very short meeting, then everyone tries to get home. You don't really get much done in the day because you spend so much time traveling. And there was a real resistance to doing that type of online communications at the time. But of course, with COVID, 
the world pretty much changed overnight. People doing you know, Zoom pub quizzes or whatever it was to kind of fill the, the long evenings or weekends where we were only allowed out for an hour of exercise at the time. And so, yeah, I was very fortunate that I was beginning to think along those lines. I'd taken the year off and the timing was very fortunate for me. So was able to kind of launch the the format that we currently have. So it allows us to cover the theory during the winter months. So instead of doing it in a kind of block where people would have to take a week off of work, we do eight online sessions over the winter and they're one a month. So we kind of work through the, the theory and it's all based on the, the professional training standards, a document put together by the Bat Conservation Trust. And of course, we can do a lot of the underpinning knowledge, but there's some things you just have to do in person. Yeah. So as we roll right into May, we then are able to go out and get in the field. So we are able to take people out and go through some of the practical things. So we talk about preliminary roost assessments. So take people to buildings and talk through, you know, revisit the theory, but then have it actually go practicing that and showing them bats in roost and things like that. We have a very similar day to that to do with trees in July. So again, ground level tree assessments. We've got a fantastic site that we use for the use of endoscopes. So we train everyone to a class two Natural England license standard, and that includes using endoscopes. And so we have a, an amazing site that was one of the, the study sites that I used when I was first interested in bats and trees. And it's very odd that it just has lots of very low level tree roosts. So there's about 50 or 60 tree roosts that are about maybe my shoulder height. And you can just walk up to them and put an endoscope in them. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier on, it's kind of just a numbers game. And the more trees you look in, the more likelihood you're going to have for finding bats. And of course, if you can just walk up to them rather than have to climb them, you can cover far more trees in a day. So we do that with trainees. And of course, during these sessions as well, we do all of the handling and the hand netting as well and then eventually we roll around to what we call the final assessment in September so we've just finished up with our trainees and just gone through that kind of final assessment process with them so uh, yeah they've the the final task they're set is to okay here's a building here's a tree you survey it you capture your notes you write up your results in a survey report and then we sit down and we mark those and we provide our feedback and if people are successful that's fantastic. We're then able to provide the, the references they require in order to get their bat survey license. And that kind of complements a range of existing experience that they gain outside of the training with us. Because, of course, the more people you work with, the more bat workers, the more sites you go to, just the more diverse your experience and more rounded your experience will be. And so, yeah, it's kind of it's helping people build on what they already have, whether that's through work, whether that's through the back group, but just provide that structure. And we've kind of see it and have lots of conversations with people that maybe they have moved around, so they haven't got sufficient training in any one place, or maybe they haven't been kind of welcomed into particular back groups for whatever reason. And uh, that was kind of an experience I mentioned earlier on that we had when we first got interested in bats. And so, yeah, it's it's we're in what we now, I think the fifth year of it, just started a, a new cohort and and continue to tinker with it. That's one of the nice things about working online that you can just adjust things and change things here and there. And I'm having real fun developing online learning resources as well. So I have a, a virtual PRA exercise. So it's a bit like Google Street View. But instead of going down your street and being able to look at your house or your car parked on the road, it goes around a building. And it's set up so people can feel like they're visiting a building in advance of actually going to a site and seeing it in person. Oh, that's great. No, I think, you know, the, I think the mix of learning styles. So um, um, my, my, my daughter's just recently gone to, you know, the, the, you know, the high school, secondary school. And, uh, yeah, you know, straight away they talk about learning, you know, as in you've you got to go now. You got to, I mean, don't think you go into a classroom, you're going to learn everything. Because you're absolutely what you just mentioned that you'll go to a conference and ten minutes, you know, uh, uh, ten minutes after the, 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 that that presentation, you'll remember about I don't know eighty percent of what was mentioned. An hour later, it's down to fifty. Go away for a day, a week, and it's down to a very small percentage of what actually was actually presented there. 
And so it is that constant top up of information, that relearning or re, re, revisiting. Yep. The, 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 so I think that's a beauty about online learning. Uh, you know, if you can talk to the same person again day to day, that's fantastic. That's even better. But I mean, I don't know about you, but I love to go and um, you know say go to a, uh, go to a conference, listen to a presentation, listen to or read, read a read a book. I have to tell someone about it. Because if I don't tell someone about it, it's not. I, I, I bore people by just talking to them, <laughs> uh, about uh, any subject I've just listened to, read in a book, and they're going, "That's very nice, Richard." But yeah, I'm not really telling it to you. I'm just telling it to myself. <laughs> I want to re- I want to. I want to explore what I've learned and get it out, so I can actually really learn it again. Listen to my, listen to my own voice. I don't. Anyway, I, I love listening to my own voice. But it's not about me. Let's go back <laughs> to you. <laughs> so it's, it's a really good point, though. This idea of, of learning and how we learn and I I kind of fell into training I think because of my temperament mainly that people I had to do short sessions at work so the back call analysis for example mm. train new staff members in how you use a bat detector and do back call analysis and people would say okay well you're very calm and you know have you considered doing this and it kind of I received enough of those that kind of feedback and those compliments to make me think, okay, well, I'll, I'll investigate this. And I, I then did a kind of a, what was it? A four day session about with learning you know, instructional techniques through Lantra. That was with a, an assessment at the end of it, which is required to become a, a Lantra instructor. And that's great. But I kind of realized I came away from it. I was working at the, both the ancient tree forum and the Arb association at the time. And we, used to send all of our trainers on this course to learn about how you deliver training and then they come away and I was looking at the training that our organizations were delivering it and I was thinking okay well the trainers have been taught this but they're not actually doing it in person they kind of it, they've defaulted back to just oh here's a slide with loads of text on it and I'm just going to read out what's on on the slides rather than thinking oh the main thing we need to get is engagement get people involved in whatever way possible whether it's discussion groups whether it's actively doing something whether it's doing kind of their own reading and kind of feeding back on things and it's encouraged me to kind of carry on I'm, I'm near I'm nearing the end of a, a teaching qualification so we'll soon become a qualified teacher um I've got just one final research project to finish I haven't quite managed to find the time to do it um but i think that's unfortunately the case with lots of people in any profession i think is that they they either kind of find themselves delivering training because no one else is mm -hmm. there's kind of just a void there and it may as well be them or they become very knowledgeable about a particular area so they think well i should share my knowledge and they don't necessarily learn and develop the skills about well how do you best communicate that how do you best educate people and get those points across and make sure that that information kind of goes into people's brains and we build on existing experience to have a, an end result that's very positive i think it's quite often an afterthought and you know I, I put myself in that camp in my early training days as well that the first thing i used to do when i wanted to develop new training was fire up a powerpoint and just start typing into it and i kind of realized now that's just completely the wrong way around that you that's the, my slides are the last thing i do now everything else is a lesson plan there's a scheme of work there's all of those things that get put in place before you get to your slides mm -hmm. and so yeah it's um if anyone's out there who's interested in training or already doing training if you haven't gone through the kind of process of becoming a teacher or anything like that you know it might be a bit too onerous but i find it hugely valuable and it's helped me not only become a better teacher i hope but also actually understand myself better that before i learned about learning styles and learning preferences i thought everyone's brains thought the same you know worked the same sorry and i remember looking back on it now when i worked in ecological consultancy that i just wasn't built for that type of work and i didn't get on particularly well with it i wasn't very good at project management or dealing with clients and my heart wasn't in it and i looked around at my colleagues and they were much better than me and i thought okay well why are they good and i'm not so good and i realized now it was just well was just the type of work that wasn't for me and i've i think i found my niche i think i found what i was put on this earth to do and um yeah it's helped me understand a lot more about myself about how i think how others therefore think and that might be different and i think one of the classic things that when people begin teaching is that they deliver it in the way that they would like to receive it which will work for some people but it won't work for everyone
Oh, no, 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 absolutely. I think there's, um, there's a lot to be said there, really, and uh, commended for, because it's, you're, you're right. I mean, you, you know your learning style doesn't mean your learning style is exactly the same as everyone else's. You know, I mean, you know, you, you know visual learners, you have to do things by, I, I mean, I, I have to, I'm a practical learner. I have to do it before I sure. probably fully understand it. So, so there is certain... You know, so yeah, I enjoy reading books, and I, I and uh, you know, I take a lot away from it. But I have to go and implement it. So if I don't implement what I've learned, I will forget, and probably also, um, you know, say just a waste of those many hours of reading and uh, or audio books. I'm quite getting into audio books too now. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, you've been very generous with your time. Um, in terms of, I suppose, let's turn. Uh, uh, sorry, for, for, how, how do people get on? Are, is the room on any of your courses currently? And we're talking about when this goes out, we're probably looking at 2024. So okay. what can people expect from you and um, uh, and your, your, your um, BAT research and BAT research training uh, for 2024? So the the annual cycle for me begins, it's kind of similar to an academic year. We we start in October and we run round to about November the following year. So uh, as it currently stands, my the training course is full for this year. The next one will be starting in October 2024 and the bookings for that will open in around April time. So if people are, are interested, they can come and uh, kind of get in touch via the website which is just batlicense.co.uk there's a kind of get in touch page on there drop me a line and um i am happy to have a kind of initial meeting with people via zoom so i have about 45 minutes to give a bit of background to the business a bit about myself a bit about the training that's offered and then hopefully give people the information to determine whether i'm the right training provider for them and if so, whether now is the right time or whether they need to kind of continue building experience before they come on. Um, so, yeah, that will kind of be coming online as we progress into 2024. I have a number of short courses. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be doing with regards to short courses next year. I think I might be taking a, a bit of a pause and I'm currently trying to strike that uh, ever elusive work life balance nice. that we're all striving for. Um, however, one thing I do know is that I will be putting more effort into my social media channels. So if people look for BATS research and training, or I think most of them are just BATS RTS, and um, so I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so there's lots of stuff coming out via those channels. So I mentioned the Facebook Live, all of the stuff that's previously been recorded is available through that. If you're not on any of those platforms, they're available via YouTube as well, which is just youtube.com. Uh, slash at bats in trees and so kind of a wealth of um, videos available on there so that's things like the presentations that we've discussed but also things like my bat id videos mm. with this idea of just trying to make it a bit more interesting and engaging and so lots of free things available there but yeah i'm um, planning to spend a bit more time focusing on that and i realize that having spoke at these conferences and i really enjoy speaking at conferences but as we've discussed already that well first of all there might be what a few hundred people there and the vast majority of the industry won't be there and even if people did attend as you've mentioned they might remember it for half an hour an hour a day however long it is but a week later six months later they may have forgotten forgotten it so my plan is to anything that's released a conference will then also be released via a Facebook Live or something similar to that. So it's available to anyone. You don't have to pay any money for it. You can access it whenever you like, as many times as you like. And uh, even if it's, you know, trying to uh, teach lots of people and I was doing a training course on bats and trees yesterday, actually, and talking about how in particular we just need to stop surveying trees covered in ivy. You know, they're just very unlikely to have bats in them yet so much time and resources get wasted on it and i think i can bring people along the journey with me in the classroom but quite often then they go back to their places of work and they tell it to their colleagues or their line managers and they just don't understand or they don't believe them or they can't articulate the arguments that i was putting together so the idea is that you know if i make this available then they can direct those people to the videos to hopefully help us all improve and help us move forward because we're all in this for the same reason at the end of the day you know we we get into ecology because of a passion and for me, one of the reasons I got slightly disillusioned with ecology was just because 
just didn't know whether the surveys were any good or the mitigation was any good. And I needed to take that time away and move into our boar culture. I thought they had it all sussed out. By the way, they don't. Uh, <laughs> you know, much as a pickle is asked quite often. Um, but again, another industry with lots of very passionate people. So I'm lucky enough now to kind of make a living from trying to sharing information, sharing knowledge and uh, kind of helping people progress and continue to learn. And the big question I'm asking myself at the moment with anything is what was it? What? Okay, right, Jim. <laughs> the big question I'm asking myself at the moment is what if it was free? And I make my living off of people coming on training courses. I'm very fortunate to do that, that not everyone can afford it, can afford the time away from work. But what if it was free? What if they could access this information? Then hopefully that will help us all move forward. And I borrowed that hugely, hugely. I don't think he uses these words, but good friend and now line manager at the Vincent Wildlife Trust, Daniel Hargreaves, that such a knowledgeable guy, such a humble guy, doesn't want any credit for anything because he's all about the bats. And he fully appreciates that if you give people the tools, then they can go and do good work. And, you know, I'm, I've kind of followed the same vein, but my slightly different is in training, mm -hmm. but realizing now that it's almost, okay, well, if people, if I'm lucky enough to get people to book on the training, I can develop resources for those individuals, but then I can also share those for free as well. So the bat ID videos were one that a uh, series of videos that were produced for the bat license training but I can also make them freely available now because what's the point in it only being available to a handful of people when I can just make it available to everyone. So yeah, keep an eye out on the social media channels and you know, if people want to come on a course, great. I'd love to meet them. If they can't afford that, they can't take the time off work, but they can take advantage of the free resources even better. Great. Well, I'll put all the links on to, uh, into the show notes then, Jim. So they're all there. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, all, your, all the social media channels there. And I suppose the final question uh, for you um, is, uh, is, is, you know, we get a lot of people who, uh, I suppose, feed back to, to, the, the, to the podcast and uh, just, you know, they are mostly early career um mm -hmm. uh, you know, people whether they have had a, you know going through a, they're on a degree course at their moments they've just completed a degree or even people who just think about changing careers and i know you know you obviously you've gone through a sort of career change yourself you know going from ecology to arb and back again and you know it's, it's both combined now what sort of advice or um you know would you give to people who are maybe just starting out on their ecological or cultural careers um yeah so i think it goes back to the point i mentioned earlier on about i i ended up in consultancy coming out of university just because there wasn't anything else available the kind of nature conservation jobs for wildlife trusts or organizations like that are very few and far between they're quite often dead person shoes so you have to wait for someone to leave before you can move into them so i ended up in consultancy and for a few years, I loved it. I got on with it really well. In particular, the people I worked with were fantastic. Uh, I used to work for a company called EDP, and I saw them post recently about their social events. Their social events were incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to meet up with a former colleague in the, uh, next month, actually, just before Christmas. So I haven't seen them for a while. So I'm going to go and see them. Did, so, yeah, the people were... Italy. Did you go to Italy? <laughs> I didn't go. No, the Rome. Yeah, the Rome, Rome where they got in the fountains. <laughs> No, we went to Paris. Yeah. I did the Paris trip. Okay. No, I didn't go to the controversial Rome trip. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's yeah. fine. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of ended up in a position where I knew I wasn't happy. I knew that uh, I didn't want to do the job. And I kind of initially, I thought it was me. I thought I was the problem. And as I mentioned, I've kind of realized now that, no, it's just I wasn't suited for that job. And I was lucky enough, I guess, that I started in this career early enough that I had options. I We bought a house relatively young, so I wasn't having to worry about saving up for mortgage, improving you know, payments for that. We didn't have kids, so I have that kind of flexibility that if I want to go and do something crazy like change career entirely or go and you know, take a massive pay cut to go and work for a different job or whatever it is, I've been lucky enough to do that. So I don't know if I can provide... Um, a great deal of advice because I've had that flexibility and I fully appreciate that not everyone has that flexibility. But I think the main thing is that if you're not happy doing what you're doing, mm. then the, it may not be you, 
it could be whatever you're doing you know and that could be the job it could be the, the organization or the company and um for me I, my wife and i have very different approaches to our careers so i think in her career she's had two jobs basically two organizations she had a very short one in between because she was made redundant from the first one and um i have gone through how many have gone through one two three four five six seven or so uh, i'd kind of noticed in my my cv that i like to stay somewhere for about four years and then i get a bit bored and kind of move on and want to challenge myself and do something new so it kind of depends on people's appetite for kind of uh, something new or that kind of risk and whether they have that security as well but i've been very lucky because i've been able to jump around and uh, in particular people have had the confidence to employ me and say yes this, this is the person for this job and uh, i've been very fortunate to get well but i think in part that's because i throw myself into things wholeheartedly and um yeah. that's both at work but and away from work so the research we've been talking about the whilst we have funding for doing the current project that's largely for the equipment so the vast majority of my time um first of all leading up to it was all free and vast majority of my time now is off, off my own back and um again not everyone has the flexibility that they can do that uh, but because I have been able to put that time in, it pays dividends in the end. Great, no, fantastic. And you know, I think it's, it's it's yeah, it goes back to that that that's uh, people. So uh, you know, being you know that uh, people are not all people are bad. <laughs> you know, there, there there are good people out there who give you your time for free, give you that advice. There's no alternative motive. Yes, you have to be aware of some people who do that, but people are generally good. Uh, curiosity and uh, and those. Um, you reminded me about choice as well. So, you know, there, you know, everyone has a choice. Now, you can either make your own choices, but if you don't, someone will make that choice for you. <laughs> so uh, I said there's a, there's a great book, I think it's called Essentialism by, I'm going to get this completely wrong, Essentialism by, I think it's Greg McCowan. I may have got that name completely okay. wrong. But yeah, he advocates, you know, what's essential in your life? And the first part is about evaluation and and it's about choice you know and yeah okay. we all have choices it's just the path we decide to take yeah but uh you know uh, uh jim it's i been, like that that's yeah, good yeah i did get get the book i mean i say i've only just started it on the chapter one into two now but um it's really good but thank you so much for your time and i wish Pleasure. you all the best for your facebook live uh, this thank you very much it, yeah and uh that you whatever you decide well, whatever you do in 2024 as well but uh for now um jim Mulholland, thank you for joining me on the ecology academy podcast thank you very much if you enjoy our show and want to help then please click on the subscribe button and rate us on your favorite podcast player as that's how you can inspire ecologists in the making help retain great talent and provide insights of our industry to a much wider audience of why ecology really does matter. Thank you. And remember, learning is a lifelong endeavour. So stay curious, be adventurous, and build bridges for others to cross.